If it is your first time, you haven't been here in a while, we are currently in a series entitled Boundary Lines. How to keep the right people in and the wrong people out. This series has been such a gift in our community. And today, as we dive into the topic at hand, so much has been about healthy boundary lines, healthy boundary lines in all areas of life. And one of the ones areas that I needed our church to talk about, to take a look at, is boundaries with the world. We're great at drawing boundaries with people. Oh, they're toxic, they need help. No, no, no. It's also where do we need lines in our life to say, this is not the character, the nature, the behavior of a God-fearing Christian. Today, we're gonna open up the Word of God and take a look at what the Bible says about boundaries by taking a look at some godly people who created boundaries in their life. Today, the person who is going to be opening up and illuminating God's word is a voice that I love and I'm grateful for. Preston Butler III has been with us from the very beginning of our community. I remember him at our old venue, walking in with his beautiful wife. And I didn't know how the Lord was gonna use him then, but I see how God is using him now. And it is, he has been a gift to this community. So will you do me a favor, church? Online, in this room, video experience, will you welcome loudly and proudly my brother, Preston Butler. That's right. Now hold on, Pastor B. I'm gonna need you to stay up here just real quick. I didn't do this in first service, so she's like, what's happening? What are you doing? Um, before you go back to your seat, one, um, I, I want to publicly just honor our pastor and leader of this church. It's Women's <laughs> History Month. And, and you are just such an inspiration to me. Um, but even now having a daughter, you are such a, uh, an example of a godly woman. And I just want to honor you. It's Women's History Month. So I just want to say thank you. I love you. Come on, come on, this is our pastor. Thank you, family. This thank is the leader you. of our house. Amen, come on. Yeah. Uh, pastor Matt, I know you're probably watching online. We love you too. Um, but hey, listen, uh, uh, before you, you sit down, uh, just go ahead and tell the person next to you, hey, you look good. Hey, if you got to prophesy, it's okay. It's all right. Go ahead, y'all can be seated, amen. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, yeah, like Pastor B said, my, my name is, is Preston Butler III. I'm, I'm just so uh, excited to be here in the house once again. Um, um, I had y'all tell each other you look good because I, I think y'all look good. I miss seeing y'all's faces. So uh, I'm blessed. I, I know that uh, uh, my wife and I, Christine, we've, we've been MIA uh, for the past few months, um, but I promise um, it's for good reason. Um, we was working on some things, um, one of those things being a new baby girl. Yes, that is my, my, my beautiful little daughter, Alila. Um, and I have to say, it's just such a blessing to be a, a, a new father. And um, it's just given me such a newfound love and respect for my wife. Uh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful. Um, this, this image of my daughter um, is actually one of the promises of God, and I want to talk to y'all today about the promises of God. Now, I know today that we're talking about boundaries with the world, right? And you know, when Pastor B asked me to speak about this, she was like, "I think you're just such a good person to talk about this." And you know, a few other people who knew what I was going to be speaking about, they were like, "Oh, you, you're the, you're the right person to speak on that." And I honestly was like, "Bro, what? What are you talking about, bro? Like, I don't, I don't. What do they mean?" Well. Literally, just a few minutes ago, they were like, well, you're an actor. You're, you're a professional actor. You, you've traveled the world. You're in the entertainment industry. You are in the world all the time. And y'all, listen, I, I've gone East Coast, West Coast. I've been overseas, done international. I've done theater, TV, music, voiceover. I've been in the world. I know what it's like to be confronted all the time, every day, with people who oppose my faith, constantly facing messaging that tells me that God isn't real, that my faith is just some make-believe system that we like to put faith in. But I have to tell you today, look, I'm, not, I'm by no means perfect. But I stand here before you as an example of a person who has held their boundaries with the world. And I can attest to you today that I am a living testimony 
of God's promises in your life if you have boundaries with the world. As I was preparing for this sermon, I said, oh, okay, God, I see the correlation here. That boundaries with the world position you for God's promises. Boundaries with the world position you for God's promises. And this is actually echoed in Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, observe all his commandments, the Lord will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. What kind of blessings? He says, you'll be blessed when you come in and when you go out. He says that your enemies will be defeated. He says that you'll be the head and not the tail. That you'll be above and not beneath. That the world will know that you are called by the name of the Lord. But understand, these promises require us to do something. They require us to be obedient. Boundaries with the world position you for God's promises. For the note takers, the title of my message today is Positioned for Promise. Now, I have to say, this could be a very different type of message, okay? Because we're talking about the boundaries with the world, and one perspective could be, well, here, let me just give you a laundry list of do's and don'ts. This is how you need to live in the world as a Christian. That's not what I'm going to do. Because I believe it's actually more beneficial to look at the benefits of having boundaries, And we're going to look at how those benefits play out in the lives, not just of me, but of some Bible characters by the name of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen? But but first, look, uh, y'all know me. Pastor B calls them word nerds. I'm for sure a word nerd. I love some definitions, okay? So let me just give you some quick definitions. Let's define what the world is, and let's define what boundaries are. The world, very simple, is anything that is immoral, or contradicts the word of God. So, a uh, quick practical tip. Um, you're going to have to read the Bible to know what it says. Okay? Because if you don't know what it says, you, you don't know what contradicts it. Okay. Cool. But I also want to point out here that this means that not everything that comprises the world is going to be sinful or outright immoral. So, example I like to use is subject matter experts. Okay, so in my own life, we had our lender, right? That was the person we went to to help buy our house. Okay, now my lender was trying to be helpful. Okay, all right. It wasn't that he was a demonic force trying to stop me from buying a house. He actually thought he was helping. He was like, listen, Mr. Butler, I've looked at the numbers and they don't add up. Um, And they didn't, y'all. Okay. Uh, He said, hey, listen, man, uh, to keep it real with you, the interest rates, they're terrible. And they were. Okay. But. What he didn't realize is that my wife and I, we weren't operating on the rules of the world. We were operating under the kingdom of God. And the rules of the kingdom of God oppose the system of the world. So even though the world was telling me, no, Mr. Butler, you cannot buy a house. I'm sorry, you don't qualify. I said, yeah, you're right, I don't. But that wouldn't make it a miracle if I did. So my wife and I had to believe the word to be true which says that God is a way maker out of no way. That God is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. So again, it's not that everything is sinful or immoral. It's things that also contradict the word of God. The world is anything that is immoral or contradicts the word of God. We moving on. Look, boundaries. Let's define boundaries. Boundaries are the limit of what someone considers to be acceptable behavior. So what should our boundaries be with the world? Well, according to these two definitions, our boundaries should limit the behavior of anything that is immoral or contradicts the word of God. Now, I got to say here, the objective of boundaries is not to kill all of the fun and to box you in. You ain't got to be no stuffy Christian. Oh, no, man, I'm sorry. I just can't do that, bro, because, you know, I'm holy, you know. (laughs) No. Look, boundaries first are meant to protect you. Hello. Hello. And they're actually meant for you to experience true freedom. So the world is anything that is immoral and contradicts the word of God. Boundaries are the limit of what someone considers to be acceptable behavior. So we should limit the behavior of anything that is immoral or contradicts the word of God. Now, let's just talk really quickly about promises. 
okay? Because where boundaries with the world position us to receive God's promises. There are a lot of promises contained in the Bible. Some of them are given to you freely. For example, salvation. You don't have to do anything to earn that. Jesus already died on the cross for you. But promises that come as a result of boundaries with the world require you to be obedient. Now, another way to look at this, um, my God, grandma, we call her Gramby, okay? Gramby say it like this. She say, honey, if you do the ifs, God will do the shalls. If you do the ifs, God will do the shalls. So let's look at Deuteronomy 28, okay? It says, if you obey the voice of the Lord, all these blessings shall overtake you. If you hearken to the voice of the Lord, he shall command, bless, command blessings upon your storehouses. If you keep the commandments of the Lord, he shall bless the work of your hands. So there is a clear pattern here. If you are obedient, God shall fulfill his promises. If you hold your boundaries with the world, God shall fulfill his promises. Now, Daniel is a beautiful example of this in Scripture. Okay? Now, let me just set the scene for you real quick. Okay? So, Daniel is part of Judah, which is part of Jerusalem. Okay? Now, Jerusalem was actually overtaken by a kingdom of Babylonians. Okay? So, they just got overtaken there. Everybody was defeated. Okay? So, they're under a rule of a new king. All right? Now, this king, they're actually smart. They do this a lot in history. What they do is they actually go and they say, we want your nobility or your royalty. We want the young boys to come to the king's palace so that way they can serve us and we can also understand their culture and we can also indoctrinate them and send them back to where they came from. This is what happened to Daniel and three other Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So what happened is they were trafficked from their home in Jerusalem and Judah, and they were brought to the Babylonian palace. Now, even though they were brought there by force, let's just make it clear, okay? They was in a palace, all right? They were set up real nice. That's the whole point. We're going to train you for three years. We're going to give you the best teachers. We're even going to feed you the best food and even wine. But then you say, hey, hey, hold up, hold up, king. Hold up. I see what you're trying to do here. And I, I'm not going to let you whine and die on me and my boys. But let's look at what the scripture says, okay? Daniel says in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. So here we have Daniel in a new world setting a boundary. Because I don't want you to miss the significance here. Right. This is sorry for my vegetarian people. This is not a pro vegetarian scripture. OK, that's that's not what's happening. He's like, nah, man, uh, I'm vegan. No, that's not what's happening. By refusing the king's food, Daniel is drawing a major boundary. And remember what I said before. Remember, everything is not sinful. Eating the king's food wasn't sinful. Drinking the king's wine wasn't sinful. So why is it such an important boundary? Daniel understood that if he ate the king's food, he would be making a public declaration of dependency on the king. Daniel is communicating with this boundary that he doesn't need anything from the king or the world for that matter, and that he is relying solely on the Lord. And what happens? Daniel is blessed. Look at what happens in verse 17. It says that God gave Daniel and the Hebrew boys an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings and visions of dreams. He put a boundary and he was blessed. But the blessings didn't stop there. In verse 20, it says that the king, when it came time for them to be tested, the king found them to be 20, 10 times. The king found them to be 10 times better than all of the other magicians and enchanters in the entire kingdom. And what's dope about this is that this actually leads to Daniel having influence. Daniel is then actually promoted to serve in the king's court. 
And not only that, but it actually says that Daniel stayed on not with just the Babylonian kings, but when they were defeated, the new kings actually still had him serve. So he served for a total of 70 years. God added longevity to his influence simply from a boundary that he kept with the world. And you know what's really cool about this? I have to say, I I actually didn't know this part about the story of Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. When you talk about influence, right, it's easy to see how if we have boundaries with the world, we can influence other believers, non-believers. But Daniel actually influenced his friends. Check this out. See, when Daniel went to the chief of staff and he said, I don't want to eat that food, that actually wasn't a collective decision by all of the boys. Daniel actually branched out on his own to do that, but he included his friends in that refusal. And because of that, all four of them were chosen to sing in the king's court, serve in the king's court. Now, What's really cool about this, I said, God, that's crazy, is that I believe that Daniel's boundary with the world inspired them to stand up two chapters later and refuse the worship of the idol golden statue, even though they faced the threat of being burned alive in a fiery furnace. Daniel's faith, Daniel's boundary with the world influenced them to have faith even in the face of death. That's influence. When we have boundaries with the world, that is the kind of influence we possess, not just on non-believers, but on our own community, on our own family, on our own loved ones. Now, let's look at one more boundary that Daniel displayed. Now, Daniel, he was so excellent that he was promoted later to serve over all the governors. He was in charge of all the governors in the kingdom. And of course, the governors didn't like that. So they was like, yo, we got to trap Daniel. But do you all know? That Daniel was so on fire for the Lord, they said, well, I guess the only way we can really get him to commit a crime is if we criminalize his practice of faith. Daniel was so solid. He had such strong boundaries with the world that they said the only way that we can find a fault in him is if we criminalize his worship. Look, I, I don't know about y'all, but that's, what I, that's where I want to be, Okay. But check this out. What they did was they signed, they had the king sign a decree to say that nobody in the land could worship any gods other than the king for 30 days. But y'all, Daniel was a G. He was undeterred. He said he went home and he prayed just like he always did with the windows open toward Jerusalem. And he did it three times a day. Daniel's boundary was clear. The world, the law, the king won't stop me from living out my faith. Now, let's not get it twisted. Daniel is arrested and he's thrown into a den of lions, but he is untouched. It says in the scripture that God shut up the mouth of the lions. Now, the Bible also tells us that one of the blessings that we receive from boundaries with the world is that your enemies will be defeated. Well, look what happens to uh, Daniel's enemies. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 24, it says that the same men who accused Daniel were then thrown into that very same den of lions along, this is graphic, with their children and wives. The lions leapt on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. But check out the influence that comes from this. The king then writes a letter after Daniel survives the lion's den. In verse 25, the king says, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For God is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Daniel's boundary to not keep his faith hidden resulted in a king of a pagan pagan kingdom to issue a nationwide cosign that God must be feared and revered. I came here to tell you today that what we do as Christians matter. 
that you having boundaries with the world matters because the world is watching you. So honestly, when I was preparing for this message, I had to ask myself, I said, yo, are my boundaries with the world encouraging people to have more faith? Or is it pushing them to question the power of a Christian walk? Because if I don't do anything different, if I'm not living in the promises of God, why would I want to serve him? Uh, Look, I'm going to come off this. Listen, (laughs) listen, boundaries with the world position you for God's promises of blessings and influence. Now, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't tell you that promises don't come without pushback. Promises, amen, somebody. Promises don't come without pushback. The world will always try to deter you from holding firm to your boundaries. But even through the pushback, there is the promise of peace. If you are steadfast and hold to your boundaries with the world, you are promised peace. Well, let's see, where do we see this in scripture? Daniel's friends, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They actually displayed peace in the midst of pushback. Remember, I told you that they actually were going to be facing this fiery furnace. Well, let me back up. So King Nebuchadnezzar, that's a big name, we'll call him King Nebi, okay? All right. King Nebi, he built this big golden statue, and it was an idol. And he said, hey... Everybody's got to bow down and worship this idol when the music plays. Well, the three Hebrew boys were like, nah, bro, we good. Thanks, man. They refused. They set a boundary. They said, nah, we're not doing it. So they were brought to King Nebi. And King Nebi said, hey, fellas, listen, you guys serve in my court. I like you. All right, just bow down and worship the idol and we'll be good. I'll call it straight. Look at the peace and confidence that they displayed. And Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, this is what they say. They say, yo, King Nebi, bro, we don't need to defend ourselves against you. If we're thrown into the fire, God will save us. It's cool. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty, respectfully. Okay. And then they say, even if he doesn't. Now, listen, I told y'all that, da- look, the co- Daniel's refusal of the flu was not a collective decision. And there's three of them, okay? So I don't know if the other two were like, hey, bro, hold on. Uh, I don't know if I... But they went with it. They said, even if I die, I want you to know, and I want to make it clear to you, that, your majesty, respectfully, we will never serve your God or the golden statue. They had peace even in the face of death. For God, I live, and for God, I die. And this is important to remember when your boundaries are tested because the world is going to try and pressure you. They're going to try and scare you into crossing your boundary. And I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to make it seem like it's just going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to feel like you're up against impossible odds. But how many know that nothing is impossible for my God? When those three Hebrew boys, they were thrown into the furnace. But not, they were never singed. And a guard looked out. The people actually who threw them in, they got burnt up and they died. Okay? Another guy looks in and he says, hold on. Hey, 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 we throw three people up in there. There's four people in there. Jesus was in there watching them the whole time, with them the whole time. When Daniel, he was thrown in the lion's den. He was probably in there having a pursuit night. He was just worshiping. He said, hallelujah. Okay? Peace in the midst of pushback. And I can't tell y'all how many times I've had the opportunity to audition for things, align myself with certain projects that don't align with my beliefs. And y'all, look, these are lucrative deals. Life-changing amounts of money. And look, sometimes, you know, breaking your boundary, you know, the consequence isn't going to be, oh, I'm going to throw you in a furnace. Hey, man, I'm going to throw you in a lion's den. They're not holding a gun to my head talking about, hey, take this roller or else. But sometimes that's not how the enemy comes. The world's just like, hey, just bend your boundary just a little bit, bro. Come on, put your little pinky toe over the line. It's cool. Everybody's doing it. Hey, you know what? Just do it this one time and you'll never have to do it again. It'll change your career. But I have peace every time I turn down one of these opportunities because no amount of money, no fame, no fortune is worth losing the promises of God. 
boundaries with the world position us for God's promises of blessings, influence, and peace. Now, what does the Bible say about the consequences of crossing boundaries with the world? There are some characters in the Bible who repeatedly cross boundaries and they turn away from God. But others suffer consequences after only crossing the boundary one time. Now, I'm not sharing this to scare you, okay? But it's in the Bible for a reason. And I believe that these are actually warning signs that are meant to encourage us into holding our boundaries with the world, okay? So let's look at three examples. Gehazi. Gehazi was the assistant to one of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament. And he let his love of money push him past his boundary. And as a result, he was struck down with a painful and deadly disease of leprosy. King Saul, who was once the best man God could find in Israel, let pride overtake him and exalted himself above God. It eventually led him to suicide. King Solomon the wisest man to have ever lived. Now, let me tell you something right now. If the wisest man who ever lived had trouble with boundaries with the world, how much more do we need help? Okay? <laughs> King Solomon allowed the influence of foreign wives to lead him into idol worship and greed. And it wasn't just the result. What happens isn't just that he is damaged or that he suffers. The result of his reign over Israel would eventually split the entire kingdom and they would be invaded and destroyed less than 200 years later. Now, y'all, those are, are some pretty serious consequences for breaking boundaries with the world. And honestly, even thinking about this, I said, wow, like, Lord, I'm, I'm convicted. Because any of those people, any of those characters I just described, they could easily be me. So I said, God, how, how do I... Keep my boundaries to, to walk in your promises. Well, I'm going to give you three practical ways that I believe will help you keep your boundaries with the world. One is the presence of God. Get in the presence of God consistently. And getting in the presence of God is not hard. You can do it through prayer, put on some Maverick City, some Fred Hammond, worship, okay? A devotional, quiet time a Christian podcast, get into the presence of God. Now, this seems really, really, really simple. And you're like, oh, bro, that's all I got to do? Shoot, I got that on lock. <laughs> Consistency is the key here. Consistency is what makes this effective. And let's look at Daniel. Daniel prayed three times a day every day. He said, bro, I'm going to get into the presence of God. And the scripture says that it was his custom. That means it was consistent. And again, I had to say, Jesus, ouch, bro. Ouch. We have to be intentional about making time and space to commune with God, to get in his presence. Okay? Presence of God. Number two, accountability. Now, as we've been going through this series, y'all, I've had to take a hard look at some of my boundaries in some areas and reassess. I've had to make some new boundaries and I've had to revise some old ones. Pastor B inspired me. I said, I don't know if I can do 8 p.m., but I'll turn my phone off at 10 p.m. Okay, all right, start small, 1%, all right? I, start, I started putting time limits on my social media apps because the world really don't need access to me all that time, hello. But to help you keep your boundaries, it is imperative that you tell someone. James 5, 16 says it like this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. This is where community is so important. This is where you got to get your core friends. Remember we talked about your core friends, the ones you trust, the ones you feel safe to be vulnerable with. Get them around and share your boundaries. Amen. Hey, the dude who just said talk about it, literally, look, check this out. The way that I do this, I got a group text with this guy right here. And we use this group text to keep each other accountable. We've been sharing boundaries and saying, hey, I need y'all to help me keep it. And it's been transformative. Amen. We need accountability through community because we cannot make it alone. And you don't have to. You're not alone. Now, the last one, it's a little bit old school, okay? But it's in the book, fasting. Well, what is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from food or drink. But it doesn't only have to be food. 
It could be TV, social media, video games, secular music, or even specific types of food like sweets okay, or meat. Okay? Now, the idea behind fasting is that it shifts our focus completely to God instead of fulfilling our personal fleshly desires. Y'all, fasting builds the same muscles that you have to use when you're holding on to your boundaries with the world. It's a habit of denying yourself things that you say that you want, things that people are trying to pressure you to do. Now, I got a little special caveat for you, okay? There's one more thing that you can do, and that's get baptized. And I'm saying this because next week, we have baptisms, okay? Next week, you can have a public declaration, a public boundary with the world to say, I was old and now I am new. Next week, sign up. If you want to get baptized, sign up. Now, these are cool. Prayer, uh, presence of God, accountability, fasting. But like, I want to make you actually like go do it, okay? So you know how they got like challenges on TikTok and people be dancing and or you could do something stupid and get you smacked by your wife or something, right? Like, that ain't the kind of challenge. This is a boundaries challenge, okay? It's super simple. This week, I got three things for you, real simple, okay? This week, I want you to get into God's presence every day. Get into God's presence every day. Number two, identify accountability partner or partners and share a boundary. Three, Pick one day or more to fast. That's it. Three things. Just this week. Now, we've looked at what's happened when people in the Bible have boundaries with the world. Okay? Now, I'm not saying your whole life going to change and everything going to be fine. But I'm saying, I challenge you. Just do it for one week. And let's see what happens. Let's see what, I'm just saying, hey, test God. Let's see what happens. Okay, and again, this isn't some kind of formula to be some sort of like super Christian. All right, that I don't even know what that is. All right, (laughs) these are just practical small habits that keep you connected to the power of God. Because when we are filled up with His power, He helps us keep our boundaries with the world. And when we keep our boundaries with the world, we position ourselves for God's promises. And y'all, listen, when we live in God's promises of blessings, influence, and peace. That's how we impact the world. That's the last thing I want to talk to you about today, the impact of boundaries with the world. Boundaries and living in the promises of God are beneficial to us as an individual, but that's not all about what it's about. Yes, that's great. Boundaries with the world are going to get you blessed. That's cool, right? Boundaries with the world is about breaking generational curses. Boundaries with the world is about being light in a dark place. Boundaries is about being a positive influence on your family and your friends and your loved ones. Boundaries with the world is about being a witness to a hurting world where people are desperately seeking for help. Boundaries with the world is about fulfilling the Great Commission. It says that we are to go unto the nations. That means the world. And we're supposed to make disciples. The world is the exact place where God needs us to be. And listen, this wasn't in my message. I believe, and this is why I feel like he asked me to preach this message right here. I believe that there are people being risen up who are not going to just sit here in the church anymore, who are actually going to go outside of the church doors. They're going to have boundaries with the world and they are going to go and they're going to influence this world for God's kingdom. Understand, that is what you are supposed to do. Jesus prays that prayer over the disciples. He says, God, before he goes to the cross, he says, God, don't take them out the world. And understand that God knows half those people are going to be killed and crucified. He knows what's going to happen to them. He knows they're going to be persecuted. He says, God, don't take them out the world. Keep them in the world, but protect them from the evil one. He said, because I need you to be in the world, but not of the world. That's why this series is about boundaries, not barriers. We're not excluding ourselves from the world. We're not cutting ourselves off and and, and building a Christian bubble. 
We are to go out to live on fire, on purpose, and live in God's promises because that's what my daughter needs. She needs to see me living out boundaries and living in the promises of God. I don't need to be walking around talking about, hey, I'm a Christian, but woe is me. You know, it's a hard life out here following Jesus. Well, bro, if it's so hard, quit. Hey, I just got, I'm keeping it real today, okay? Because I believe that God is building up an army of believers who are not going to settle for a lukewarm version of Christianity anymore. If we don't walk different, talk different, live different, love different than the world, what distinguishes us from them? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray over all of us. And I'm going to pray that God strengthens us to have and stick to the boundaries that we have with the world. And as I pray this prayer, I, I want to encourage you. Think about the areas in your life where you need to put some boundaries with the world. Think about where maybe you have some boundaries, but you've been tripping up a little bit lately. Think about how you can reconfigure those boundaries to protect yourself and to honor God. Because boundaries with the world, they position us to receive God's promises. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you humbly. Because, Lord, we are broken. We are weak. And, Father, we need your power. We need your strength to hold strong with the boundaries against the world. God, we cannot do it without you. So, God, we need you. I pray over everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord. I pray that you fill them up with courage. I pray, God, that you fill them up with faith. Not just, God, to receive blessings from you, God, but to influence the world for your good. To influence those around them, God. Lord, I pray that you give us the spirit of Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. That we will have push in the midst of pushback. Push back. God, that you will raise us up to go into the world and to affect it for better. Father, we love you and we praise these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before you're able to walk and live in the promises of God, and before you even set boundaries with the world, there's a decision that you have to make. Because, listen, you can, you can follow the tenets of the Bible. You can be a good moral person. But this decision determines where you spend eternity. The Bible says that you can't serve two masters. You either serve God or the world, but you can't serve both. Out of God's unconditional love for you, he sent his son Jesus to die for us says in the word that Jesus did that so that we could experience life more abundantly. And I want to tell you today, I want you to experience life more abundantly. I want you to encounter the living God, the God of the universe, who wants to be in an intimate relationship with you. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that today, to start living in God's promises today. I want to give you the opportunity to accept salvation. And if you want to do that today, I'm going to count to three in just a second, and I want you to raise your hand. By raising your hand, you're doing three things. You're saying first, God, one, I accept you as my personal Savior. Two, you're saying, God, cleanse me of my mistakes, which is called sin. And you're saying, Holy Spirit, I'm inviting you into my life. So if that's you today, if you want to take the first step into walking God's promises of blessings, influence, and peace, if you want to go out into the world and make it a better place for God's kingdom, if that's you and you want to accept salvation today, I want you to raise your hand on the count of one, two, three. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, come on. Come on. Let them know that they are making a decision 
that is gonna affect for the rest of eternity where they are going to be. Listen, in the video experience, we see people see you. If you're online, people see you. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited. So here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And you know what? I actually want all of us to repeat it together so that they know that they're not alone. So if you raise your hand, raise your hand. Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you today as my Savior. Thank you, God, for dying on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I love you. I pray that you come into my heart today. I pray that you build me up. I pray that you heal me. And I pray that you make me a servant for your purposes. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet and worship.